We're going to talk about um, the helper and the client. Um, I'm going to clarify what that means. Uh, basically, it means we're going to start um, for, this is the beginning of chapter four, So, you, and we're trying to move towards engineering for community development. So what I want to do is start with a very simple case. I want to talk about, set up a case where we have one person, the helper, helping one person, which we call the client, okay? And that's going to be like an engineer helping one person. It's easier to discuss that case uh, than trying to work with the whole community, okay? It's going to focus the conversation in, in a nice way um, and, uh, really set some very important concepts that will later be used in the community case, okay? So um, first I want to talk about a, a very basic issue, and that is, is engineering a helping profession, okay? Um, the traditional helping professions are so-called counselors. Um, some of those are psychologists or psychiatrists. Um, a psychologist does talk therapy, a, psycho a psychiatrist does he, he prescribes medicines, okay? Um, th these are medical doctors, these are people with PhDs. My wife's a child psychologist, okay? Um, social workers, okay? Um, we're gonna be talking about what they do quite a bit in the next few lectures. Um, but basically, they work on uh, social problems of all sorts, everything from homelessness to poverty to any, any kind of issues like that you can think of. They do work with individuals also. Sometimes they are counselors, okay? They're trained that way. They're educated that way. So, but they also work with groups, big groups, communities. Um, also, traditionally included with the helping professions are people um, that are figureheads or leaders of religions that might be, um, in Christianity, a, a, a minister or a priest, we might call them. Uh, in, uh, and it might be in, in Islam, uh, Imam. In uh, um, Hindu, it might be a guru, as they're called. Okay, so there's different names for all of these different cases. But those are typically the people that are sort of one-on-one -on -one helping you. But there's other people, other professions are often referred to as helping professions. Those are things like teachers, okay, lawyers, doctors, nurses, and more, okay? So there's all kinds of helping professions. So in one of the char fundamental characteristics in, in this situation, these situations with these people is they are professionals that work in direct contact. Just like we're in a situation right now. We're in direct contact, okay? I'm a teacher. Um, you come to my office, we're in direct contact. We're working like that. But these people are doing a lot of other things, right? They're working with, uh, you know, um, various problems, mental illness, and, and poverty, and many, many, many things like this, okay? So engineering traditionally has not been thought of as a direct contact profession, and therefore not a helping profession. It's not put in that category um, over time. However, there are counter examples that have grown over the years. One, one is the area of rehabilitation engineering, so you might invent on a special wheelchair for an individual, and an engineer might literally work closely with that disabled person. Okay? Um, in ergonomics and human factors, I think that there are times where an engineer will work very closely with people. Uh, in that sense, they, they're like a direct contact. In IT support, often work very closely with an individual, but um, those are, that's a relatively small percentage of engineering, that, that set. So what engineers often are is what P I, you might call invisible helpers. So what does that mean? Well, you know, an engineer um, often is doing the underlying technologies. You know, the guts of the condenser microphone, the crankshaft in an automobile, the, the, the chip in the computer. You know, they're, they're kind of, it's all hidden underneath and this creates a big problem for the profession actually because nobody knows, most people don't know what's underneath anyway. It's just a big magic box, the computer, right? They don't even know what a chip is, they don't understand what a bus is, they don't know what a clock rate is, they don't know what a clock is, they don't know any of that stuff. I mean, engineers are doing that behind the scenes and then the technology that people see and touch, you know, 
is what they talk about. So it's why when you go to a party and you say you're an engineer, they say, somebody, when they're fought, they usually say, oh, or ooh, or uh, right? They say, oh my gosh, this is a nerd. I gotta get away. I mean, they say all kinds of things. You can hear it. I've heard it for many years, okay? But somebody that's thoughtful will ask this, what do you really do? Okay, and how you answer that, it, it's complicated to explain, right? Because you're not going to teach them calculus. You're not going to show them differential equations. You've got to be able to explain what you do. Now, here's what's happening, though, historically, is technology is becoming more ubiquitous, of course, and in, in contacting people's lives in more and more ways. Okay, since I was a child, I mean, when I was in college, there was no personal computer and no cell phone. I mean, think about it. That's not that long ago, actually. Um, and to think how close this technology is to us now. So technology is really ubiquitous. It's pervading our lives. And so it becomes more and more likely, I think, that people, as engineers, will come into contact with people who are not engineers and try to use them. Because you use, use them. Use the technology to help people, right? Because what, after all, technology is nothing but a tool to extend human capability and an engineer then can come in close contact. Now this becomes especially relevant, it's not just philosophy and history, it's relevant to humanitarian engineering. What you're going to be seeing over the, over the next several lectures is, is that really what we're talking about is a new type of social worker, a social worker that's an engineer, okay, or an engineer that's a social worker. Um, and uh, they're going to be working on something we're going to be calling participatory development or participatory technology development. And then maybe you can even view that there's a new type of teacher for STEM. I see no reason why engineers can't be teachers, right? You can finish your BS and go become a teacher, okay? I think you all can do a fantastic job of being a teacher of STEM. It's not going to pay as well, okay? But very rewarding career, okay? So, in these common cases in humanitarian and engineering, there's, a, there's direct contact. Okay, this is, we're, we're becoming, in humanitarian engineering, at least some percentage of it, is a direct contact profession. It's not a question. Not all of it, though, okay? Um, there are, there, you could be working on the underlying technology and never interface with people just in the traditional manner. No question, okay? So I'm not saying all humanitarian engineering is direct contact, I'm just saying, these common cases, and some people would say imp very important cases, um, the field is um, making engineering um, a helping profession. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is helping today. Uh, I'm going to use this book by Gerard Eakin, um, and uh, basically, uh, so when I was in graduate school, hanging out studying with my wife, a psychologist, uh, she had this as a textbook for class, and I read it because I thought it looked interesting, and indeed it was, okay? And so this is that book, only I read back then the third edition, this is the 10th edition, okay? It has changed, actually. Um, so we're going to be talking about this. this is, so this is a very common book to be used by not just psychologists, though. This can be used across the helping professions. Um, so, first, the client is said to have a problem situation. Their immediate living conditions, that might be their household, community, impact on the environment, and they might have challenges like in generating income, getting an education, or accessing health care. So they're, they're in some problem situation. Um, what's the objective? So the objective is to help the client solve or manage the problems by improving their problem situation. That's worded carefully. It does not say you are going to solve the problem. It says you're going to help them solve the problem. That's going to be a very basic principle in what we're doing over in quite a few lectures. Okay? So you also help them identify resources and opportunities and exploit their own potential. All right? You want to show, say, hey, you know, can't, you have this. You could do this yourself. And they're like, oh, yeah, I guess I could. So you want to enable them. Okay, um, that's a broad overview. First step, so it's the clients to say what they want to do about their problem situation, not you. So what do they want? That's a very difficult thing to figure out for them, perhaps. 
you might have to give them guidance on what they want because they may look at something and say, oh, I, I never knew that was feasible to change. And you might have to say, well, actually, I think we can do that. Okay, so, so it, it, you guide them in trying to, but you, put, you let them to say what's important. So the question then is, is what are the goals or the problems to solve? They have to be important to them. They have to be willing to work on it. It can't be a dynamic where you say, what do you want? And they say, well, I want this. Why don't you give it to me? No, they have to work for it. Because they're working for it will demonstrate that they really want it. Okay? You're enabling them. So primarily this has to be client specified. You, of course, can give some inputs as I just mentioned. Next. Um, so what you're trying to do is help the client learn to help themselves. Okay? You want to put the client in the driver's seat. In other words, you're not the one driving all the change, they are. Okay, you're sitting back in the back seat and saying, you know, I think you better take a left here. Okay, things like that. But it's their choice. Um, so, goal though, is you want to help them find something that's a life enhancing outcome for the client and by the client. So a life enhancing outcome, you can use many measures for that, such as the multidimensional poverty index, you could use the um, human development index, which says it's all about money because of living standards, about health and about education. So you can have, as a professional, you ought to have life enhancing outcomes in mind, but they're picking, and if they say, my biggest problem is health, I need healthcare, I need, I need to do this, I have contaminated water, well, focus on that. Okay, so um, again, put them in the driver's seat. Let them pick the goals. Um, but the helper has to be, is a professional, is doing this. So they have to help the person find simple enough goals. The goal shouldn't be, uh, I'm going to make a million dollars a year. Um, you got to find some realistic goal. Help them find a realistic goal. And you would like to find some goals in the beginning of a, in, in your relationship with a client that um, will give fast and perhaps small success. So that they look at this, they get success, and they're like, I'm buying into this process. I believe this works. This worked for me in one case. I'll try it again and go for something bigger. All right, so you, you try to um, motivate the client and give them hope. Hope is something that can be really, really important. If a person has tried many, many times to fix their situation, they lose hope. And if you meet someone that has no hope, it's, it's pretty gripping. It's, it's kind of depressing because um, it's hard to give people hope that have no reason to hope, okay? Um, so you want to give them, try to help them find goals that will have uh, immediate cost-benefit ratio greater than one so that it will incentivize them. In other words, benefit divided by cost should be greater than one. Okay, so somehow it's got to be they're getting more out of doing this than they're putting into it in a sense. So they look at it and say, yeah, it's worth it. It can't be that it's going to, you can't say, well, if you consider the next 10 years, the benefits will be this much, the cost will be this much. Uh, it's too far in the future. You've got to give, make it immediate. That's why I add this word immediate. Sometimes it's useful to have an exemplar in the community. When they look at this person and say, look, they solved their problem. We think we could do something like that because it will seem very feasible to them. And they'll, it'll also seem like, hey, you know, this, uh, this person did this and they're doing better. So they'll see a very clear benefit, okay? They might even know the person well enough to understand the costs. And you might be able to help them set a goal and find a path to reach that goal. Um, the lower right figure is meant to connote you notice the little person only has one piece to the puzzle to put in and they hit their goal so that's that's meant for me what it means is is that let's find something in the beginning that's easy that really helps me achieve something useful in changing my living standards for instance next try to state goals in terms of outcomes you want to be specific you want to say something like we're going to end this water contamination problem you have, okay? It has to be important. Well, water could be very important because why? Because it affects your health and your kid's health. It has to be prudent. What prudent means, it's sort of wise. 
it, it's, it's not too much, it's not too little, it it's, uh, fits within the current constraints of the problem situation, <coughs> it fits in the current context, et cetera. Um, realistic, sustainable. You don't want to achieve something like, oh, we're going to put in water filtration, but you know, we're going to do such a bad job in, in uh, this technology that it's going to fall apart in no time at all, and you're not going to have you achieved a goal that will like clean water that will last very long. You don't want something like that. You want the goal to be flexible. What that means is you might want to set a goal in a way, you, it's kind of a trade-off. You want it specific, but you might want to keep it a little bit general because if you can't quite achieve everything or some subset of it, it might still be okay because you achieved some other subset of the goal. It has to be congru congruent with their values. That is what they value, what they think is important and achievable in some I should say perhaps fixed time frame, some agreed upon time frame, not too long. Um, now there's the idea of second order goals or second order change. Um, this is just a terminology where you get a flavor for what it means. It means you change the system rather than adjust it. You create something new. You make a change that endures rather than one that's prone to collapse. You transform rather than fix. You might use new learning. You might address causes rather than symptoms. This is gonna be a big issue in the community too. Sometimes you might wanna go in and fix a health problem, but if you haven't fixed the contaminated water, the health problem's just gonna keep popping up. So, and engineering is very good at times, for some cases, at addressing root causes, okay? Like water and sanitation are root causes of problems with respect to health, but also, as you know, impact education and so forth. Education is another root type thing, okay? So these are so-called substantial, real, or good changes. Um, so problem. If you're going to try to get a life-enhancing outcome, something that's you know, important and something where the client will really feel an effect from it, it's going to be constrained by the overall context. So what Egan means by context is sort of like everything, actually. Everything else, or but some part of the client. The problem situation. Past successful or failed attempts to change your problem situation. What if over the last 10 years, 10 OSU groups went down to Honduras and couldn't solve this problem for these people. They're sick and tired of OSU. You show up and say, I can solve the problem. You think they're going to believe you? And it's not just OSU, it's other programs, right? There's all there's different people that may be trying to do something. Um, what is their first or, or I'm sorry, employ unused opportunities or resources. So uh, you may see some unused resource or opportunity and su suggest that the client uses it, but they may have tried that in the past and that doesn't work for one reason or another. Their personal history. So their expectations, aspirations, and disappointments. You know, what do they want to do? What do they aspire to? What skills or strengths does the client themselves have? If you're going to help that person, okay, and their hopes and um, their fears. So it's sort of all these constraints. It's a very complicated situation. I mean, you think engineering is difficult. If you start considering how complex these kind of situations, just with one helper, one person, are. These are really complex situations. We're going to jump into a community. So we're thinking, oh, let's say 500 people. And we're going to walk in with a team of 10 and try to pick, fix the problems or help the community fix their own problems. These are really hard things, OK? Uh, so other issues with the client, are they open or ready for change? Are they willing to work? And, and that means labor, right? That means you know, spending their time, maybe their money too. Do they have reluctance or resistance to change? Okay, um, because maybe a little fearful. You have to have some courage to change usually, right, in life, because change means things are different. It's like, what's that gonna be like? It creates uncertainty for an individual. Their ability or willingness to collaborate with the helper. And that can be, have a lot to do with the helper themselves. The helpers, well, Handling things properly, it may be very easy. They might want to work with you. If you're not, then they may be like, eh, I don't want anything to do with them. Um, what's their sense of right and wrong, and ethics and morality, culture, 
values, behavioral norms. All these things matter because in this dynamic of working with you, these things will matter a lot, okay? Um, these things can matter with respect to uh, discrimination. What if the client, you, you may not discriminate against that person, okay? Of course, that's an issue. But what if they discriminate against you, okay? How are they gonna treat you? Uh, there could be gender issues in this situation that are problematic. Um, what existing relationships does the person have so they can draw on those relationships? How good can they communicate? How good communicate? Are you going to learn a language? Okay, and I don't just mean, you know, whatever, Swahili. I mean the language of the people is, you think, okay, let's say homeless people in Columbus, Ohio. The language is typically English, but what I'm talking about is the lingo. What's the on the street lingo? Do you know how to talk to these people at their level and, and understand their terminologies? They have different words, uh, different terminologies. You know, when they put the sign up and ask for things, it's called flying a sign, okay? So they have different ways of saying things. Can you talk the talk? Um, and then, of course, there's many external factors to support change, such as a government or a nearby institution or NGO. So what should the effective helper do? Well, you need good inter interpersonal skills. Um, you have to build trust, and history matters. If, if historically um, the US government has um, uh, supported assassinations of your president or a genocide in your country, uh, they might look at you a little, like a little funny, okay? And that's not just a random case, that's real. Uh, I know you're not your government, but you gotta live with the fact that we look, you look, just think of a country, pick a country anywhere in the world. Usually you think of a country like a dog. <laughs> it's this little thing, right? Well, they look at us that way too. So if you're a dot, it means that you're all kind of the same. Aren't all Americans basically the same? Aren't all people from India basically the same? I mean, that's absurd, okay, we know that, but people don't often think about it. Um, you basically want some type of agreement with the client Scratch one on on the goals. You want to try to understand their situation and identify the causes of the problem situation. You want to try to promote client self challenge. <coughs> so you want the, the client to challenge themselves to do better or to fix the problem situation. And the real challenge here too is not just working with this one individual who's complex enough in a very complex situation, problem situation in context. But you have to understand the broader context of the cultural, social, economic, and political context. So this is why we discuss these things in the class. That's why we talk about things like religion. Because those contextual things matter a lot at the end when you're working with somebody on the ground. Um, you got to maintain a flexible stance um, and try to react to changes as needed. You have to be competent in creating candidate solutions and persuasive with suggestions. You walk, this is a very difficult situation to walk in. You walk in with a person, you, you hear all this problem situation and you say, well, I think we need this type of technology for water filtration. Wow, that's a hard choice. Several groups in this class are finding that. That's a very difficult choice. Okay, so you have to, but you have to know how to approach these things. If you're gonna be a competent humanitarian engineer, you have to understand technology and people. That, that makes it especially difficult. Um, you got to help monitor progress. We'll set up feedback methods to monitor. And you got to really, it's, I think this is important. Um, trying to instill hope and optimism, I've found over time, I feel like it may be one of the more important things about the process. Besides solidarity, solidarity is, I think, crucial. You, how you relate to people on the ground and, and connect with people um, uh, is really, really important. Solidarity gives hope and optimism. Uh, so you don't try to avoid difficult issues. Um, and you have to be committed to professional self-improvement. They call it commencement. That means you, when you commence, at the commencement, you start, right? So that's when your professional development starts. You start from a foundation, Ohio State, and you develop yourself, your competence over the rest of your life. Okay, same thing applies here. Uh, so Egan calls this uh, helping is a two-person collaborative exercise in creativity. 
What he means is, is creativity in many ways, it's like a design team. This is in engineering, we call this a design team. Uh, it means you want to invent goals. You want to um, invent an understanding of the problem situation in the context. It means you want to invent ways to get out of the situation. There's all kinds of creativity that are going, that's going on um, in this process. So the client has to be helped to nurture their creativity. That's a lot of what the undergraduate program at Ohio State's about is nurturing your creativity. Give you the tools to think about creativity in the context of technology. So encourage them to generate ideas vary existing things to adopt them or via collaborative brainstorming and do what's called divergent thinking you, because there's many solutions um, to a specific problem. The key here is, is you, you might say, well, shouldn't the engineers run off and, and uh, hang out together and brainstorm about <coughs> solutions? No. Do it with people. You should do it with, the, the, if you're one-on-one -on -one with the client, you should do it with the client. Why? Because guess what? They understand the situation much better than you. They're living in it. Okay? They know all the good things. So they'll just say, I don't think that's going to work. You might have to say, well, why not? And they'll have to say, well, dummy, because of this. Well, I didn't know that. So there's this dialogue going on of understanding, and they're teaching you, too. You might teach them some things, but they're teaching you also. Not a question. There's no way it'll work without them teaching you. I think it's essential that they're teaching you. If, you. if you feel like they're not teaching you something, you're failing. There's no way you can just sit back and know, you know what to do without knowing what's happening on the ground. So in brainstorming, uh, engineers are generally very poor at brainstorming. And usually the situation goes like this. Is engineers joke about this all the time. Put a bunch of engineers in the room, ask them to brainstorm on some technology. What they typically do is somebody says, the brave soul raises their hand and says, what about this? And everybody shoots them down. And then somebody else raises their hand and everybody shoots them down. And it just goes on and on and on. Everybody gets shot down, so nobody's going to raise their hand at the end. Okay? So what you have to do is suspend judgment. Now the reason you want to do, you don't want to shoot ideas down when they're just suggested because what can happen is, is sometimes they can be developed. So somebody suggests, I suggest an idea. Tyler says, you know, hmm, he doesn't quite like it, but just let it go for a minute. And then, then he says, well, wait a minute, what about this? So he builds on the idea and comes up with a better idea. That's why you don't shoot the idea, the original idea down. You, you, gotta be, you sort of have to be patient. This is, this is a classic problem with engineers is they're not patient and sort of, or we're trained to criticize, right? We're trained to find the problems. And we, we're, we jump too fast to find those problems, okay? So don't just shoot down the client. Don't shoot them down. Listen, hear them out, and give it time. So somehow you're gonna come up with a set of ideas and then you down select later, working with the client. Um, and those, of course, can be useful for goal setting and, and plan selection. Next, um, <coughs> you, very complicated issue, I think, is tailoring your helping to the client. So you're going to work with, let's say, somebody in, um, you know, Haiti versus somebody in Tanzania. Uh, you know, what's you should tailor. You know, and it's a it's a man in Haiti and it's a woman primarily in, in the, let's say, the it could be even the matriarch of a village or whatever. Yeah, these two cases, they really can be quite different. You have to tailor what you're doing as a helper to the individual. So Egan gives this example. He says, though, on a class of people, he says, clients who are mainly from lower socioeconomic class, like cases we're considering in this class, um, wanted advice. In other words, I think you should do this. I think you should do this. Very clear advice. Signs of real interest in their problems. Encouragement and reassure, reassurance understanding and installation of hope from their helpers. Okay, so some other kinds of people may not like that. They don't want advice. You know, they want to kind of work it out on their own and let you follow them. How do you know how to adapt? This is a very dynamic interpersonal situation that's pretty complex to deal with actually. So the helper-client relationship, some, um, Egan also says it's called a working alliance. I think that's a nice way to think about it for humanitarian engineering. He says his foundations on flexibility, honesty, 
Honesty is really important, I've found. Um, if you make a mistake, just say so. I made a mistake. Why? Because you know what? They're going to respect you from then on. Okay? Uh, it's almost like you want to make a mistake. Don't do that, though. But I'm just saying, you know, just be very honest. Respect the individual. Some engineers have a problem with arrogance. Um, any, in general, people have problems with arrogance, right? I don't think engineers are any more arrogant than any other profession. Um, but you gotta be careful with this issue of, of respect someone that doesn't have technical abilities, okay? Sometimes engineers have a hard time with that. Um, but I think it's really important to do that. That person sitting across from you could have a much higher IQ than you, but have no technical abilities, right? Okay. Um, so, uh, trustworthiness, in other words, if you say you're gonna do something, you do it, okay? I've heard from some of our clients we work with in our program that say, that's why they like to work with OSU. We're trustworthy, we say, we say we're gonna do this, we do it, actually. Okay, they're not used to that sometimes in their lives. Um, should be based on confidence, warmth, okay? Be friendly, be fun. Interest and openness. Um, he says that clients appreciate the following things. The self-presentation and body language that's open. Nonverbal gestures. Got to be careful with that, right? Because different gestures mean different things in different cultures, but you got to just go with it. You can't learn everything. Emotional support and care, honesty, <coughs> validation. You know, if they're doing something good, validate them. Say, you're doing something good. I think that's awesome what you're doing, okay? You give them guidance, you challenge them. So clients do like to be challenged because it's respectful to challenge them, right? I mean, if in a class I treat you like a bunch of babies who couldn't learn, that's not respectful to you. You're all smart. You can learn, you can do this class. You see, see the difference? I mean. I think it matters that you challenge people. Um, helper's education matters, which I find this one interesting because, you know, if you go to my wife's office, she's got her, her degrees up on the wall, her PhD, et cetera, her diploma. I don't see that in any faculty offices, it's certainly not in mine. We don't do that as engineers. We don't hang our credentials out, okay? Whereas helping professions do, go in your doctor's office. You know, it's the same thing. So, uh, this one here, I think they want to know that you're educated, but engineers may not wear it on their sleeve. Uh, and that seems okay, but they want to know that you're competent. They want to know that you have an education in, in, so that when you say something, there's something behind it to back it up, okay? Um, so, and that they appreciate that they're self-responsible. Self so the helper, has to show respect. The old statement from uh, medicine, um, the Hippocratic, from the Hipp Hipp Hippocratic Oath is, you know, do no harm in the relationship. Don't rush to judgment about the client and their problem situation. This is difficult for some people. If you look at the situation, you say, some people seem to say, why in the world are you in this situation? It, this is your fault, you know? This is your fault. So I'm not helping you get out of this situation because you screwed up and put yourself in this situation. That it, it would be jumping the gun usually. Um, you know, everybody can get themselves in bad situations. You can in your own life. But you have to be highly sympathetic. That would sh if you jump, rush to that kind of judgment um, without really understanding the whole situation, that would be really bad. Uh, you have to be competent, committed, genuine. Uh, Egan says that you would be phony if you overemphasize your professional credentials. Uh, you know, let's say, you know, what if, when I work with someone um, in this situation, do I require them to call me Dr. Passano? Professor Passano? No, it's Kevin. Okay, period. I mean, why? They'll develop the respect if the respect is deserved. This is the way I look at it. You don't need to emphasize your credentials in this manner and overemphasize that you're the engineer. I'm here to help you. I'm the engineer, listen to me. It has to be much more collaborative and down to earth um, and non-sentimental. So um, you talk eye to eye at the level, I say this a couple times in the book, 
not down to them with con condensation. Con <laughs> condensation, I like that. <laughs> condensation, <laughs> the engineer's version of it. Um, so, <laughs> so, so uh, being down to earth is difficult for some people, but being down to earth means sort of um, like you talk to your friends. And uh, sort of like, you know, you're just, you're just talking as a normal, normal person. And uh, that can be difficult at times, actually. Um, and we'll talk about why in a minute. Um, you have to assume the client has goodwill. They're not trying to rip you off or rip the system off. Um, and you have to focus on um, their agenda. Show respect. Now, I think this, is, this can be difficult for some people. For others, no. Um, so what do I mean? Usually, you show respect via what's called empathy. Empathy is a really big issue in this, this setting of helping. So what you try to do when you're working with your client is you want to step outside of you and try to step into their shoes and say, what would it be like to be that person? In other words, what is their perspective on their situation? Um, you know, they always say, walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. This is very difficult to do. It but humans can do this, okay? You really can do this. But it requires you to have empathy. It requires you to, put your, to get out of your stance of the engineer, get in the stance of where they're at, and then say, oh, I see why you're saying that. If you're, you can train yourself to do this. You can educate yourself to do this. And I think it's really quite important in this process because it can help. It's like, in your mind, immersing yourself in the client's problem situation and context. And, of course, it's a mental exercise and you can never perfectly do it, right? You can't do that. You can't perfectly achieve it. But you should try to do it. And if you don't, because if you can do it, then you can make better suggestions, etc. right? Um, Appreciate diversity and multiculturalism. And so focus on humanity and dignity. Humanity and dignity, those are big words here. I mean, that matters a lot. Can you look at another person you're working with, and I don't, I grabbed all these colorful pictures just to make a point. I don't care what color they are, what their whole cultural context are, can you just look at them as a human being with dignity? And just, just talk to them like that, okay? that actually can be difficult, okay? Can you do that for someone who is of a different color, um, different religion, and is severely disabled? Can you really do that? Put yourself in their shoes, okay? That's hard. I say that's, that's hard for anyone, okay? Uh, it's hard for me, okay? I think I can get better and better at it, though, as I sort of practice it and don't look at them and think, oh my gosh, why, is, why do they do that to their hair? <laughs> you know, why in the world? You know, what are they doing? None of that kind of stuff matters in the end. It's the individual, okay? It can help a lot if you do your homework and try to understand at least something about poverty. That's what we're doing in this class. About culture. Very hard to understand culture. Um, gender roles, etc. And work with clients the way they are. Now, if you want to talk about complex issues with culture, again, I could, we could do that after class because it, those are difficult um, topics and require uh, a lot of time. But um, even for the other country that I understand, I think, better than the U.S., I'm still baffled at times, you know. So, um, next, communication skills are important. You have to pay attention. This is called empathetic presence, okay? You are zoned into this person, is the way I would say it. You're listening, which we'll call active listening in a moment. You understand, and this is a pretty bold statement that Egan makes, that you understand what the client's thinking and say. What they're thinking? How in the world are you going to do that? That's hard, right? Now, when you know somebody really well, like Ann and I, my wife, we, we can sometimes complete each other's sentences. Okay, you know what I mean. There's people like that you can do this with. But that's dicey. I mean, you can't do that all the time. No way. Um, you try to respond based on a good understanding. You try to help the client explore concerns and help them challenge themselves to develop new perspectives on their problems and on new situations. 
you take turns in speaking, no monologues. That's one of the problems with this lecture format. This is, I don't like. It's a monologue, essentially. I hate that. Because what do I get out of it? I don't learn a thing, right? I mean, they always say professors love to hear themselves talk. Well, there's truth in that. I mean, but it's baloney because it doesn't give you anything. It's the same thing with these monologues in this situation. A dialogue with another individual is you talk, I talk. Okay? And we're going to talk about how that dynamic should go. The, you, the diagram on the right, uh, I went and you Google Images, which has every possible image you want. So this is good, right? So there's a, communication is like this big mix of everything between the melding of the minds. Here is I talk, you talk. We haven't melded. We're not really dynamically melding in the communication. That's bad. Okay? We're just talking past each other. So active listening is a very uh, common term that's used. It's also called empathetic listening or focused listening. Um, the way Egan does this is he says, oh, here's, that's what you're supposed to do. Here's the way to explain it. Here's what bad listening is. And we, you, you people know all this. A lot of this just simply makes sense. You're not engaged with the person. You're partially listening. This happens in conversation all the time, right? You sort of skim the service and pick out the high points. Ignoring the person, kind of paying attention. Oh, the, the common thing these days, everybody. This is the emergence of the phone. Oh yeah, I'm listening. Follow me. You're not listening, right? Could you imagine going into a, like a psychologist and have them fiddle on the phone while they're talking to you? But this has happened. This is in the last ten years. This has arisen. It used to not be the case. So this is happening all the time now. People, you know, there's partial listening. Um, and not really tuning in. So in other cases where you get the words, but you're not really present, you can actually do this if you train your mind. You can be on your phone. I can, I can do this with my wife. I'm sure I can. I never tried it, but I can be messing with my phone. She's saying something, and she says, you're not listening. I just repeat everything back she said. Look, I was listening. No, I wasn't. I repeated the words. I just stored them in working memory and spit them back. I didn't understand. I wasn't empathetic. I wasn't focused. I wasn't actively listening. Okay. Other thing that we all do, unfortunately, is we rehearse while the other person's talking, right? So we're like, I'm thinking of the answer. This person said something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this response. We do this all the time, right? Humans do this all the time. Blah, 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 blah. There's also confusing things with my wife and her friends. So my wife and her friends sit and talk. I can't, I can't sit with them. I can't. When my wife and her eight friends from high school talk to each other, they all talk at once. Literally. They're all talking at once. And they're all getting it. They are getting it somehow. This is baffling. So, so listening in con I always joke with them about this. Listening in context means something like this. This is a fantastic image from Google. Um, listening in context means you're, you're, you're listening to a person, but you've got this in your mind. You're listening to, you're pulling in all of the context, you know, the poverty, the culture, the religion, all this stuff. And then you're hearing them talk, and you're pulling it all together where they're living everything, and you're sort of integrating that, okay? That's challenging. It shouldn't be that you're doing listening like you did with your kid when you were a kid with two cups and a string, right? With wax on it. Wow, that made the listening better. Um, it, it's not supposed to be like that, right? It's supposed to be a, a very close understanding that you have. Um, next, focus on the client. Organize. So you want to know about client experiences, points of view, values, intentions, proposals for ideas, how to fix problems, decisions and plans, their strengths, opportunities, and resources. All of those things you want to know about. I mentioned a few of those already. Um, but you have to put it all together is the point here. I mean, you've got to look at all these things and say, well, here's the problem situation. This client can work this much there's uh, these opportunities they have. They have this resource. Integrate it all and say, why don't we do this? All right? So try to be a person that sort of like gives an outsider's perspective in a sense. So you integrate. This is called integrating the client narrative. So you take everything that's been said, the whole context of everything, you put, and you put it together. And if you think you don't understand something, just ask. Create a summary for the client. Say, okay, this is what I hear you saying. Summarize, summarize, summarize. And they're gonna pick at the pieces and they're gonna improve your summary. Another approach would be for them to summarize for you. Both can be useful, right? And 
to try to gain an understanding. After you've done all that, then you respond. So you sit and think about it. There's nothing wrong with taking some time. You know, doing it the next day even. Uh, and you're supposed to be perceptive. All right, have confidence like we discussed a moment ago with respect to technological solutions, for instance. You have to be accurate. You have to be assertive. In other words, you, you can't be too wimpy. You've got to say, I think this is a good idea, and this is why. Okay? Um, but it's delicate, because you're not going to be given any orders here. Okay? Uh, and then you consider all the issues, and you try to say something useful. So, uh, from the client's perspective, this is what Egan calls the standard problem management framework. So the question to the client is, what's going on? That tell, then they explain the problem situation, they explain context. Like that's what he calls the current picture. And then you ask them, well, well, what does a better future look like? Uh, that's the preferred picture. Uh, this problem solved, water filtration solved, uh, better education, whatever it is. Okay? And then the question is, how do I get there? What are the plans or actions to move from the current picture to the preferred picture? Okay? That is the way forward. And how do I make it all happen? That is, on the ground, what real concrete actions should I take? What sequence and what sequence in order to get this done? So the client plus the helper work on all this together to try to, try to figure it out. So what's the helper role? So you have to be active, empathetic, and focused in your listening. And you essentially um, create what you might call a model the model is like this, in your head, uh, a mental repre representation of sort of everything that's going on. The, problem si the client, the problem situation, the context. You put this all together. Of course, you could write some of this down, okay? But um, this kind of a model um, uh, is important to be formed in, in the uh, helper's head uh, and uh, uh, it can be very difficult and you have to accept it's not going to be perfect and you, if the imperfect parts you want to learn more about from the client or so forth, what's, how to make it right. And then the, the helper is supposed to use that model to generate responses and suggestions and inputs to this process. So they're supposed to be like abstracted up here at a higher level and look at the whole thing and say, and I think it's good to do this, I think it's good to do this, it's sort of a high level. Okay. Clients on the low level, on the ground, making it happen for themselves. They're in the driver's seat, okay? Next, just briefly, there is a question, and th th I think this is really important. Should you help or should you not help, okay? Uh, so usually this will happen in an initial screening. You might look at the situation and say, nope, I'm not getting involved in this. Or things might evolve to a point where you stop helping, okay? So, um, if the client already appears to be solving problems on their own, seems very capable, walk away. Let them solve problems on their own. Why? Because they're going to gain a sense of accomplishment and, and hope by doing things themselves. It's just better to let them go. Don't get involved. If um, a client has an history of not engaging in the helping process, helping process, for instance, expecting to always have things done for them, uh, if it's an older individual, if it's a child, of course, you help. Ch children are supposed to be dependent. You go to Montani de Luz in, in Honduras, you're helping the children in the orphanage, no problem. I'm talking about adults, okay? And if an adult isn't going to help, they just want freebies, forget it, walk away. Uh, if the client really only has minor problems, this can happen pretty easily. You run into a situation, in any country in the world, there's rich people. And you walk in and you think, you know, you look at the stats and you think everybody's poor and they're not. So you don't want to get trapped in a situation of helping someone who really does not need your help, okay? Because um, they only have minor problems. A client with a low commitment. So they might have competing agendas from family or job or demands on their time. So this is going to be a delicate situation. Um, if they can't commit to helping improve their life, then, well, you probably shouldn't help them. However, this one's complicated because some people are in situations, for instance, let's say you have a disabled uh, mother that's living with you um, and it's full time. You're taking care of this person full time. That kind of person may need your help on some things they normally could do themselves. Okay, granted, without a question. 
So each of these situations is very, very complicated. Okay? Um, then there's certain clients who simply don't want your help. They don't, they don't want anything to do with you. Just walk away. Nobody's going to talk. You're not going to talk somebody in to helping them. You know, that doesn't make sense. Okay? You just walk away. Okay. Um, finally, um, being a feedback control person, I, I know everybody already saw this. Uh, that whole process we just described is a feedback control system. Really, seriously. Uh, I realized this in graduate school uh, and wrote a paper about it, um, and uh, you can get the reference at my book. But if you just think about it, it goes like this. So this is the client, this box here. Client establishes goals, those are on the left. The client takes actions. The problem situation in the context is right here, and there's uncertainty in that, okay? So what they do is they take actions to try to change the problem situation into something else, one that meets the goals. What I can measure about the situation is the measured output. So what the, what the client does is looks at the current problem situation context, somehow picks actions so that measured outputs satisfy goals. That's feedback control. Okay, that's feedback control. Now. Um, in this context, see, the reason I'm doing this is because you know the concept of the feedback controller. That's cruise control, right? That's temperature control. You get the concept. So th there's a feedback process. So this thing can converge over time, right, by, by take, picking the right sequence of actions to make measured outputs be such that they're meeting goals, okay? Now, what Egan is saying actually can be represented in the following way. So forget about the upper part, just look at this. We've got the client, so they got a set of plans. These are the possible act sequences of actions the client is going to take in order to change the current picture into the preferred picture, as we called it a few minutes ago. In other words, how to get where they want to go, how to get a life-enhancing outcome. So they got these set of plans, they pick the best plan, they execute the plan, and execute it by just generating a sequence of actions. They take actions on the ground. They design, help design a technology. They do something like with respect to hygiene. Uh, they dig a ditch. They do whatever, okay? Um, in this process, though, there's this um, box down here that says execution monitoring and situation assessment. So this is trying to figure out if the plan is working. So you, a lot of people think, oh, I got a plan, I'm just going to execute the plan, and it's going to work. But in reality, no way. It's generally not going to work. Let's say I want to go right now and get a bite to eat over High Street. I, start, I have a plan. I, I think of a map of the roads. I pick a plan. I start walking. Why wouldn't that work? It wouldn't work because they close roads, right? What do you do? You replan. And I go another route, right? So there's uncertainty. This is that uncertainty, okay? The client's trying to navigate the situation. It's very complex for them to do that. And they try to navigate the uncertain situation to fix their situation and get a life enhancing outcome. Now, that's the lower level. This is going on at the lower level. At the upper level, what's happening? The helper generates this model of this whole situation and it, this says helper model adjustment. So they adjust this model. They're continually watching things and watching things adjust. They hand the updated model over to this box. This box says, I'm going to generate some guidance, some input, some suggestions. Okay? And where does that go? Well, that generally goes somewhere down here. Uh, you know, I think you ought to pick this plan now rather than this plan. I think, the, so that's picking the best plan. I think you should consider other options for plans. Okay, um, so on and so forth. So, so the, you see, so there's a feedback loop here at the bottom. There's a feedback loop at the top, right? Now you say, that's hopelessly complex. There's no way we can ever analyze this. This is as old as the hills, this idea. Okay, what's it called in feedback control theory? It's called model predictive control or receding horizon control. In artificial intelligence planning systems, it's simply called a planning system, okay? So this is, these aren't new ideas. These are, have been in engineering for m many years. That's why I, well, many years, I, I wrote that paper in like 87, so that's a few years ago, okay? And back then it was old, these ideas were old, 
okay? So um, there's very strong connections then between, in my view, between engineering and helping a person. You could say, even Egan uses the word engineering in his book. An engineer is trying to engineer a solution. He says, he says we're trying to engineer a solution. In the book, he, he even relates STEM. He used the word STEM and relates it to this. So the, it's not, the disconnect isn't is nearly as big as you think. The problem is, is this is an incredibly complex situation. It's incredibly complex. I am not proposing to you that it's easy to model this situation and simulate it and simulate it. I'm not saying that's easy at all. I'm not saying it's easy to model the brain of a client. Oh my goodness. Okay. But pieces of it you can model. Okay. And can understand what we can understand what's going on in the context of thinking like an engineer. For me, it's pretty satisfying to find out that the way that we think is actually kind of like what they think. Okay? I, I, I'm, not seeing, I'm not seeing concepts in engineering that the, the people in these helping professions don't have and use. In other words, it's, it's fascinating to see this like unity between these fields. It's, it's really, really quite amazing. Okay. Um, Thank you. Sorry I went a little over. Uh.